Hey, Ryan here. Does your company have a commercial or industrial IoT project coming down the pipe? Reach out to Vary and let our world-class specialists in hardware, software, data science, and design bring it to life. We're going after a different problem and and kind of a different core customer than those meal kits. And what makes us unique, kind of the ability to access that customer segment and solve that problem is the oven and the connected nature of our whole business. You're listening to Over the Air, IoT, Connected Devices, and The Journey, brought to you by Vary. In each episode, we have sharp, unfiltered conversations with executives about their IoT journeys, the mistakes they made, the lessons they learned, and what they wish they'd known when they started. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Over the Air, IoT, Connected Devices, and The Journey. My name is Ryan Prosser, and today we're joined by David Rabbi, founder and CEO of Tuvala. We're going to be talking about the recipe for creating a successful connected device that lives at the intersection of food and technology. David, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm excited to be here. So David, you know, pun alert, obviously I dropped recipe on purpose. You guys are doing some really cool things with food and food tech. For those that don't know, can you tell us a little bit about Tavala and the mission of making it easier for people to eat better? Yeah. So Tavala is a uh, connected smart oven paired with a chef prepared meal service. And so the idea is we we send you meals that are pre-prepped, mostly raw ingredients. You spend about a minute preparing your dish scan a barcode and the oven downloads the proper cook cycle from the cloud and cooks your meal automatically in 20 minutes or less. So you get kind of the best parts of home cooking without any of the pain associated with chopping, cutting, marinating, cooking, or of course, cleaning. So that's that's the vision at a high level. So there's some others in in what would seem to be the same space. I don't know, like Blue Apron comes to mind, but you're, you're not really in that space at all. You guys are targeted at busy professionals and, and you've, you know, well, you're here on the show today talking about hardware. Talk to us about what you guys are doing that's a little bit different and, and the product that comes along with the food. Yeah. So when you when we think about meal kit companies like Blue Apron or HelloFresh or Home Chef, they're in the business of helping people learn how to cook and also eliminating the planning and shopping that goes into the weekly meal cooking process. We are we are going after a very different customer and solving a very different problem. We're, we're really focused on people that want a high quality meal on an average Tuesday or Wednesday night and, and don't have time to do it. And, and a lot of our customers tend to replace food delivery with Tavala. So it's folks that are ordering from the door dashes of the world two, three, four times a week. And it, a lot of our customers are people that tried Blue Apron, but ultimately churned because it, it wasn't actually solving their problem. And so we're, we're going after a different problem and, and kind of a different core customer than those meal kits. And what makes us unique, kind of the ability to access that customer segment and solve that problem is the oven and the connected nature of our whole business. Can you, I mean, we're going to get into product market fit in a minute, but can you talk a little bit about what you thought was, or you guys felt was that unmet customer need or what your thesis was going in that you thought those companies weren't addressing? Yeah, the the core thesis was that on one side, you had a bunch of companies that were sending people ingredients, helping them learn how to cook, but but customers are still doing the cooking. On the other end, you had a lot of companies sending people food that was fully cooked and asking them just to reheat it in the oven or the microwave. And we felt like the intersection of those two was actually the biggest opportunity because you, you get to capitalize on people's desire for the best parts of home cooking, the raw ingredients, the smell in the home, the taste of the food, texture of the food, but the convenience of the other end where it's just scan a barcode and and voila, your meal is done. So it was kind of the intersection of high quality and high convenience where we felt like there was nothing on the market really addressing that well. So uh, bridging high quality and and convenience. So like uh, on the one side, you guys are trying to really nail the service you're providing. So you've got this this hardware, you've got the service behind it, which is software. If then on the other side, there's food. You know, you guys are responsible for pulling that together. That's, at least from our point of view, very unusual. Can you talk about bridging, I guess, what I would call culinary and tech, you know, and really needing to be masters of three things, hardware, software, and, and the, you know, the food piece of that? What does that look like? Let's start with that. Yeah, it's a great question. That's at the core of what makes our business 
different. It's what makes the business really hard. It's very hard to operate a business like that. It was very hard to get it off the ground, but it's also what lets us deliver on that value proposition we were talking about. If, if we only did one of those three things or even two of those three things, we wouldn't be able to send you raw ingredients that require a minute of preparation and, and no cooking. The reason we can do that is we've got chefs in an R&D kitchen. We've got chefs in a production facility. We've got software that kind of sits in between everything. And we've got an oven that we've built that does the cooking. And so it's this full system, very similar to Nespresso or Keurig or Peloton as, as companies that we, we often look to as comps that allows us to deliver on kind of this product promise. You know, what makes it hard is you, you need multiple different disciplines working together on a unified mission, but with very different work styles, work languages, backgrounds, experiences, that, that makes things really challenging, I'd say. And, and we're far from amazing at it, but, but I think we have gotten some things right that have allowed us to get to this point. I, I, I have to believe that one of the unique challenges of your company is is that the, you know that difference in skill sets you know so you've got people with culinary backgrounds at very you know the company that that i i run you know we really have a, a big focus on hardware a big focus on software to say nothing of like having a big focus on food and how do you bring all of those i mean we struggle just with having hardware and software people be able to be under one roof for example like uh, agile engineering, you know, engineers just go nuts when you try to wedge that into their worldview. That says nothing about like introducing a giant group of chefs with their opinions and their workflows. What does that look like for you guys? I mean, just culturally, how do you make that work? Yeah, it's a great question. And like I said, I don't, I don't think we're the experts by any means. There's, you know, continued challenges on that front. I think a few things that we have done really well are build a strong company culture and one that is very team focused. And so you combine that with a, a group of people that have a high learning mentality and really believe in the growth mindset. We have a lot of people that want to learn. They want to learn other disciplines and they want to do what's best for the team. So that's a really good recipe, I would say, for minimizing conflict and friction when folks are trying to work together but have very different styles. They, they often share the same goal. So I think that's, that's one piece We've been fortunate to have several people in the company that have become glue factors and, and bridges, as I like to say, that are great at speaking multiple languages and understand all the various parts of the business. So they can work really well to bridge gaps between different functions. And we've got folks like this throughout the organization. And having those has been game changing for us because they, they are the ones that really help get things done between functions. So I'd say those are, those are two of the things, but, but again, it, it continues to be challenging. And, it, and as we add more people, you know, it's, it's a new challenge for everyone that joins. Yeah. I know that, uh, you mentioned you worked really closely with your CTO on the technology development. He was really instrumental in driving a lot of these things forward. Do you, when you think about the technology side of the business, like from a chicken egg perspective, did you first view this as, or I guess, did you first and foremost view this as a software problem or a hardware problem on the technology side of, of your approach? I mean, we hired our first software engineer and first hardware engineer within a, a month of each other. So hard to say which one was a, a bigger obstacle. I think probably hardware at the time just felt a little more front and center and, and higher risk and bigger challenge in some ways. But frankly, we, there's never, you know, if you think about the three stools, the software, hardware, and food, we really haven't ever been at a point where it's like, well, one is 10 times more important than, than the other two. I think right. really what makes the business go is that all three of those are really important. And, you know, for, for some parts of the organization, some are more important than others. For our customers, some are more important than others. But net net what makes the business really special is that all three of those have to be really important and we have to be really good at all of them did can you talk about the so like focusing for a minute on the hardware and then let's move to product market fit i'm always super interested in how people what that journey looked like but but just staying on, on the product for a minute you guys have this oven that you know helps people prepare the food it scans the barcode it's like very integrated with the software to call it just an oven i think underserves what you guys have developed but for people out there listening that are building a hardware product they either know or they will so soon learn hardware is very hard 
Can you talk about in you guys' hardware journey, how off the shelf is what you've built versus like a total ground up rethink on like a, what am I thinking of? Countertop oven. Is that, I don't know if that's yeah. the right category to call it, but yeah. Can you talk about the extent to which that's a rethink or off the shelf or a blend? Yeah, I, I'd say it's a blend. It's definitely not an entirely new oven concept. And, and that was very deliberate. You know, we, we felt like ovens were great tools to begin with and, and definitely did not need reinvention. That was our thesis. There are other companies that had different theses on, on the same device. Uh, and especially as we thought about what was the primary use case for our customers. And, you know, the, the core use cases, you order our meals, you scan a barcode and, and it cooks automatically. And we didn't need to recreate the oven to deliver on that. So we, we worked with companies that were already making countertop ovens. Some of the, the critical changes that we had to make, though, uh, our ovens are steam ovens, first off. So that allows the, the food to be a lot juicier when you cook it. So they all have, you know, we've got two generations of ovens. Each of them had different mechanisms for storing and boiling water and, and generating steam within the chamber. But it gives the chefs another lever of a different way to heat up the food. And sometimes the steam is combined with dry heat, which is a very powerful way to cook. That's pretty uncommon in the home. It's, it's, it's quite common in the commercial space, but you don't see a ton of steam ovens in, in folks' homes. So that was kind of one piece. And then the second piece is, is the connected side. So the oven is Wi-Fi enabled, and, and that allows us to do a whole host of things, uh, including updating our recipes every single week, depending on what's landing in your homes, uh, adding recipes for you to make yourself to the app, adding grocery items that can cook just by scanning a UPC code. Uh, so, so those are all things that are enabled by the, the Wi-Fi connection. And, and that was a, a major change that we had to make to the, the ovens that we were working with. And then, you know, design elements, branding elements, some UX things that we did ourselves as well. So shifting a little bit now to product market fit, you talked about, you know, this is an un, uh, unusual in the home way to cook, pr allows the chef some flexibility, provides an outcome that people love as far as the quality of the food. One of the questions I ask everybody on the show is how did you know you were building the right thing? Hardware is so scary, you know, because you, ma you make it first and you find out later if anybody actually wants the thing. And I think that you guys are the first to have come out of Kickstarter that we've ever had on the show. So you, you mm. guys started on Kickstarter, got some great traction and never looked back. Can you talk about you know, I, I it, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that journey? Sure. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, first off, really humbled that we're the first Kickstarter company to be on the podcast. Uh, a little surprised, but that's awesome to hear. Yeah. So we did Kickstarter about a year before we actually were in homes, and the goal there was first prove out some demand for the product, and second get a base of early adopters that we could kind of test things on. Up until that point, we had done a lot of beta testing, just putting the hardware in homes, making the food ourselves. The hardware was pretty different. It was something we bought off Amazon and modified. And, and that gave us some early evidence that people liked what we were doing, but, but very nascent and informal. The Kickstarter was another positive step. We sold about 1,000 units on Kickstarter, but our business is not selling ovens. Our, our business is selling food. And that, that was a very hard thing to get hard data on until we were actually in market. So Kickstarter was another, hey, we reason to believe that we should keep up with this thing. We launched a year later and, and it was a bit of, hey, all right, this is it. We're putting it in market. Let's cross our fingers and hope we weren't totally off base. And we've got enough here that we'll learn our way into finding product market fit. And, you know, the early data was really positive from customers. People love the food. And that that was a huge question mark for us of like, all right, are people actually going to like the food? Are they going to keep ordering it? What is our retention going to look like? And in those early months, even though our menu only had five items every week and the ovens were, were fairly early stage, customers love the product and they, they stuck around in a, in a pretty big way, especially as we were comparing to really anyone else doing meal, meal kits or prepared food. The challenge was that we could not know, we could not figure out how to acquire new customers. So existing customers love the product and our retention was really strong. And because it's a, a product that people are ordering every week, we had pretty nice revenue figures for, for a new company, but we were really struggling to translate that into new customer growth. And that was about a two year journey, I'd say from we launched in the summer of 2017 and it wasn't until late summer of 2019 
that we really unlocked it and found product market fit. I, I remember you saying previously that that retention allowed you to kind of, w- one of the things we hear a lot from, from entrepreneurs is like, convenient facts allow you to rationalize things away. And you guys had this great retention early on and you said, you know, the world is fantastic, but you you were struggling to drive new growth. And that was a hard reality. You, you discovered that it wasn't a product problem, I believe, is the, the yep. discussion from previous. And that there was a lot of, but that like elevating marketing really unlocked things for you. Can you talk a little bit about that journey and what it looked like to, I don't know if that was customer education or awareness, or maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So the way we got there is we kind of went back to basics. We interviewed some of our best customers. These are folks that were, had been with us for a year and a half, love the product, high engagement. And we wanted to hear from them. How do they describe Tavala? How do, what do they tell their friends about Tavala? Why do they love Tavala? And we did 10 or 15 of these interviews and really started to pull out some common threads between all of those. So that was kind of part one. Part two, we went and interviewed people that had spent a lot of time on our website and not actually purchased. And we got them on, we paid them, got them on the phone and just asked them why. What what are the reasons you didn't get over the hump? Because clearly something resonated with you that you were going to spend three, four, five minutes on our website. And from there, we got another list. We took those two things rebuilt the brand, rebuilt our website, and redid our pricing strategy. And those were the three major levers that we used to drive up our conversion rate, which was the real metric we were tracking. We, we, you know, At the time, we were acquiring a certain percentage of customers that landed on our website. We needed to get that percentage up by about 20%, 30%. And if we could, the economics would start to really make sense around LTV to CAC and starting to scale spend on our website and, and really start to drive growth. And you know, the new website brought a lot more trust for consumers. It helped educate around what we were doing. It answered some very fundamental questions for customers about what this product is, how it works, what it isn't. And then the pricing strategy really reduced the barrier for folks to get in and try the product. And, and those things were massive, massive levers for us. And it was almost like overnight, things started to click and, and we had more demand than we could actually fulfill. Interesting. So it sounds like there was a number of small iterations, but a few Eureka breakthroughs and pricing was one of them. Yes. And then not to discredit or diminish, you know, these, uh, this, these hard earned lessons that you guys used to, to drive growth, but I'm guessing COVID was probably pretty good to your business. Is that fair to say that during a time when people are in their home, a company like yours has become, I, I, did you, I'm guessing you guys had a pretty good 2020. Yeah, yeah. COVID was, was certainly very good for us. I think we're really, really fortunate that we found product market fit seven months before COVID. Sure, because yeah. Because it, it, it gave us a lot of credibility with investors when we went to raise money during COVID that, hey, once, once this thing starts to pass and normalize a little bit, our business is not going to fall apart. Because we grew, we grew about three and a half, four X before COVID, you know, from that point when we found product market fit. Uh, but then COVID was definitely a boon, you know, it was a huge driver of demand for us. Usage went up, really every metric went up and to the right and did for a long period of time. Operationally, it was hugely challenging because I bet. We, we produce our own food. So we, we employ a lot of people and especially those first few months. When no one knew left from right, and we, we didn't really know what COVID was and how to keep our team safe, but we had to continue operating to stay in business. Those were very, very difficult times. And, and on the supply chain side as well, just getting product from our manufacturing partners overseas was a huge challenge and, and maintaining inventory was hard. And then similarly on the food side, prices for commodities were spiking, products were short, you know, huge shortages, things like that that were just unique challenges we hadn't dealt with before. But from a demand standpoint, it was great. 2020, we, we grew the business a ton. I, I've seen before where some environmental boon, me, environmental meaning like outside force, breaks it, uh, in your favor, in the favor of a company, but they haven't solved the core issues. It can actually be one of the worst things that could possibly happen because it puts everything on steroids for a brief period of time, but it's not sustainable. And to your point about like having solved the product market fit issue beforehand you know you had a repeatable process you had a sustainable business model and then this just kind of put gas on the fire is that a fair yep. characterization 
A hundred percent. A hundred percent. So everybody that we've ever had on the show that, that is an entrepreneur has had to solve some version of their company at one point was on the wrong side of impossible. No company worth owning isn't in some way on the wrong side of that line initially. You solve it, it's valuable, no one else has, you know, not at your price point or in your way or whatever. Can, can you talk about for Tavala what that's looked like, what you guys needed to solve? Could be software, hardware, culinary, it could be more than one thing, but what, what was one or some of those things that you really needed to solve for to be here today having the success you're having? Oh, so many. <laughs> it's a long list. I, yeah, I think the marketing one is the most black and white one that we needed to figure out how to market the product. What, what was interesting is the core product that we launched with worked really well. And the product now is way, way better. But I think even that MVP would still be a very successful business from a just pure product lens. We needed to build a ton of infrastructure around it to support that. That has been challenging. You know, we, we produce a lot of meals every week now and building the operational and supply chain expertise and procurement expertise to do that on a week over week basis with a changing menu is very complicated. Uh, and it's not something that is unique to us per se. There's other companies doing similar things, but that's a hugely complicated operation that has to work week over week. And, you know, just th th there cannot be a breakage there because our customers are expecting to get our, their, our food every single week. So, you know, that was one area where when we found product market fit, we weren't ready. And it's, you know, you try to prepare, but it's very hard to know at what point you're going to find it, if ever, and when you do what it's actually going to mean. And it's funny, you know, we, we would put it into our, our investor presentations of we're going to grow this fast and this is when it's going to happen, but you, you don't really know how you're going to find product market fit and, until you do and, and what it's going to look like when you find it. And we found it and all of a sudden it was like, okay, the hot potato has gone from the marketing team to the ops team. The ops team, we got to figure out how we're going to fulfill all of these meals very quickly. And that's that's a human equation. Like it's not, we're not trading in, in bits. Like every customer that we add is more food that we have to ship out of the uh, facility. And and we were we were caught a little flat footed there. That was that was a, a big mistake in hindsight, and hindsight's twenty twenty. But that we didn't react quick enough. Of oh my god, this house is on fire, and it's just gonna the fire is just gonna get bigger unless we do everything we can to to put it out. Um, and eventually we did, but those were some painful months for some folks on our team. Operational issues, you know, they, they're they're always measured in months. You know, you just by the time you realize something's wrong, you've now discovered where you're gonna spend the next six months of your life focused on or nine months or whatever. So you talked about hindsight being 2020, uh, you know, I always love to ask about these face palm all-star moments. Everybody's got them. The thing that, you know, you went for it and it just, it just didn't go your way. Was there like a, a time you can tell us about where you know, you've had all this success, but this particular thing was just a total fizzle dud, something that hasn't gone you guys' way? Yeah. I'd say when we were searching for product market fit, 